In our last lecture, we sketched the outlines of the three great Islamic empires, respectively the Ottoman, Safavid, and Mughal empires between the 16th and the 18th centuries. Today, we'll take a look at their economies, which, although fundamentally agrarian, also relied on a significant amount of domestic and international trade. Both the Ottomans and the Safavids imported goods from Eastern Asia, in fact, all the way from China. In this graphic, we see routes connecting East Asia, extending to Central Asia, moving into the Safavid lands, and making their way towards Ottoman Constantinople. Note that these are global trading patterns functioning as conduits to bring goods from Asia into Europe, and, as you can see from the lines here, that trade proceeds further to the west, expanding out from Constantinople into southeastern Europe and the Mediterranean basin. Constantinople, now known to us as Istanbul, is the gateway to the west, and it becomes a very large, wealthy metropolis because of its central role in the global commerce of this period. The Islamic empires also developed exchange relationships with the most important English, French, and Dutch trading companies, which effectively monopolized commerce with these eastern empires. There also were close economic relationships between the Ottomans and the Italian merchants operating in cities like Genoa and Venice, who were on the western end of the Eurasian trade routes. In the case of the Mughals, there is less reliance on foreign trade, primarily because it's a much larger land empire and internally has a much more coherent domestic market, so it was possible for goods to be exchanged within the Mughal realm on a much larger scale. The Colombian exchange, that is, trade between Americas and Europe, had an effect on the Islamic empires as well, but it's less significant. From 1500 to 1800, the population of Western Europe grew steadily as the Colombian exchange increased, while population growth in the Ottomans and the Safavid empires was far less dramatic, testifying to the smaller impact of the Colombian exchange. The Islamic empires did not experience the extensive introduction of new foods and plants that one finds, for example, in Western Europe or in East Asia, for that matter. Coffee and tobacco are probably the most important new products that make their way into the West Asian Muslim world, where they were initially resisted because of their possible pernicious moral effects. Certainly, the use of coffee and tobacco was opposed by more culturally conservative Muslims. We can contrast this with cities like London and Amsterdam, where coffee houses had become a fixture of European culture, buzzing with conversation and the exchange of ideas, and quite often political activity as well. Now, let's take a look at the religious cultures spawned within the Islamic empires. All three were characterized by religious diversity, but in very different ways. Of course, all three were ruled by Muslims. In the case of the Ottomans and Safavids, Muslims are a large majority, but there are also significant minorities. In the Ottoman Empire, these were represented by Christians and Jews. In the Safavid Empire, by Christians, Jews, and Zoroastrians, an ancient Persian religion dating back to the early 2nd millennium BCE. Here is a wonderful illustration from the early 17th century that attests to the variety and importance of religion in the Safavid Empire. It's from Isfahan, which became the Safavid capital city. Called Visit to a Dervish, it depicts as the Dervish a bearded man sitting in a long robe on the left. He's a Sufi holy man. Sufism is a mystical sect within Islam and is actually still quite vibrant in Iran and, to a lesser extent, in Iraq. The image conveys the sense that the three visitors on the right have come with reverence to learn from the holy man, and he seems to welcome their search for enlightenment, testifying to the importance of religious reverence within Islamic cultures. 
The image itself comes from the museum at the Topkapi Palace in Istanbul, the residence of the Ottoman sultans for nearly 400 years. In the Mughal Empire, the Muslims were a minority in a predominantly Hindu society, which featured other religious communities such as the Jains, Christians, Sikhs, and a small number of Zoroastrians. The diversity of religious practices in the Mughal Empire reached its height under Akbar the Great, who fostered tolerance for religious heterogeneity and encouraged the exchange of theological ideas. In these Muslim civilizations, non-Muslims were often treated as protected persons or dimi. Here's how it worked. In traditional Muslim theology, Christians and Jews are seen as those who have not accepted the final truth of the Prophet Muhammad, but they're not in the category of infidel. They're considered to be the recipients of important previous prophecies from precursors to Muhammad. The prophecy of Moses for the Jew, the prophecy of Jesus for the Christian. Consequently, non-Muslims who believe in these prophecies are to be treated with a level of respect appropriate to their protected status. So, although dhimis were excluded from certain duties assigned to Muslims and did not enjoy the specific political rights reserved for Muslims, they had the right to worship, to own property, and also to govern themselves in prescribed ways, particularly in the Ottoman Empire. However, they also had to pay the jizya tax, just as Muslim subjects paid a similar tax called the zakat, what we would call alms. It seems there's no escaping the tax man, no matter what your religion. So, it should get our attention when, in the Mughal Empire, Akbar the Great abolishes the tax paid by non-Muslims, further advancing his efforts at conciliating the different religious groups within India. For most of its existence, the Ottoman Empire was characterized by an acceptance of religious diversity that allowed Christians and Jews to live their own lives and even occupy important positions in the Ottoman state and in various outlying regions and areas that the Ottoman Turks controlled. However, in the case of the Mughals, the environment shifted in the 17th and 18th centuries, and the relationship between Muslims and Hindus became much more confrontational, a development that, in the view of some historians, precipitated the eventual decline of the Mughal Empire. We'll pick up this story in our next lecture. Until then, best wishes.